Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's LRD webinar series. Today, we are going to look at resources available to you beyond the UDC library. This session is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube as soon as it is processed and done. We have two presenters today, Glenn Benedict, who is our Access Services Librarian, and Chris Anglum, who is the University Archivist. They are going to present on two things, and at the end of the session, we will have time for Q&A, both recorded and unrecorded. So, Glenn, take it away. All right. Thank you, Megan. Um, I'm just going to add, turn on, uh, share my screen here. Um, so, right now, uh, we're going to talk about um, sort of resource sharing at UDC. Uh, this, there we go. Uh, so my name is Glenn J. Benedict. I'm the Access Services Librarian. Um, my emails, um, you can either email me directly or if you email the circulation desk, I get those emails as well. And I'm usually the one that um, uh, will, will take over responding to those emails. And then my office number is um, in there as well. Um, oh, there we go. Um, while I'm screen sharing, uh, Megan, if anybody has any questions in the chat, just um, let me know. Um, will do. Yes, and we will have time for questions uh, at the very end, but if you do have any as we go, please put them in the chat and I will let the presenters know. All right, so um, I'm sure this has happened to uh, everybody is that, you know, you're doing research or you hear about like a book or an article that sounds really interesting. Um, so you get excited for it, you go looking for it, and you find out that we don't have it. Um, it could be that it's already checked out, it could be that our copy is missing, or that we just don't own a copy at all. Um, so I'm going to go over three options for you. I'm going to go, um, the first two are CLS and ILL, and I'll go over what those, uh, those acronyms stand for. Those are your two primary ways of getting stuff delivered from another library to uh, the UDC library, where you can just come and pick it up. Uh, the other option we have that I'll touch on pretty briefly is the DC Public Library. And um, they have a lot of locations. And as a UDC student, um, you can use your one card to get a DCPL uh, library card as well. And you can check out books from there. So those are three options I'm going to go over. And then Chris has was going to um, discuss some other options for other places you can go for other types of materials. Um, so the first option I want to go over is uh, what's called Consortium Loan Service, or CLS. Um, so UDC is a member of um, WRLC, or the Washington Research Library Consortium. That is just a group of the sort of university libraries of the sort of major universities in the DC area. Um, so it's the, the Georges, so George Mason, Georgetown, George Washington, uh, Catholic, American, Marymount, Gallaudet, and Howard. And so we're all partnered up, including some of the law libraries that are associated with some of those universities. Um, and so we have an arrangement where we have a shared collections facility, and then we have a courier that delivers items um, throughout the district. And so that's an easy way to get something. Uh, so things you need to know about CLS is that it's for physical items only. You're going to place the requests through UDC, our UDC catalog, which is also called Primo. Um, you're, in this case, you're going to be requesting items from you know, one of the eight partner universities in the DC metropolitan area. Um, our, these items arrive via a courier which runs, in our case, Monday through Saturday. It actually runs seven days a week, but we're not open on Sundays usually. And the turnaround time uh, delivery is approximately two to three days. That's from you submit the request, another university gets the request, they, that day they pull it, they put it in a bin for the courier, the courier might pick it up that day. Um, the courier will then, depending on what route the courier is doing, they might be able to deliver it that day to us, or it might be another an extra day um, for the career. So best case scenario, you're looking at about two to three days um, for CLS. And I'm gonna walk you through how you can submit these requests, um, how to search in the catalog um, for those 
um, as well. So I'll walk you through just doing like practical, like um, in real time, how you would submit those requests. Uh, the other option we're going to talk about is interlibrary loan or ILL. Um, so from ILL, you can uh, you can request physical items or digital copies. So that would be if you need a journal article or uh, a chapter of a book. Uh, book chapters, if you don't need the full the full book, just getting a you know a scanned copy of one one chapter is a quick and easy way to get the content that you need without having to wait for the full item to arrive. You will submit these requests through your My Library card, and I'll show you how to access that from the library main page. The system we use for that is called Iliad. Um, so we, we're not just limited to uh, institutions that are in the DC area, but we actually, um, you know, we have hundreds of libraries across the country that supply books to us and we supply them. Um, so you're, the pool of potential sources is much bigger. Items arrive via mail. So we are right, you know, we're talking right now in fall of 2021. So if you're aware of what's going on, you know that the mail is very slow. Most items arrive through the US Postal Service. There are occasionally we get things from UPS or FedEx, but most everything comes through the postal system. So you can be, uh, be aware that not only are things slow because they are traveling um, through the mail, might be traveling across the country, but also the slowdowns in general at the post office, they're understaffing, they're underfunding, they're underfunded. Um, be aware that things are even more delayed than they would normally be, even when the post office is operating at full capacity. Um, so the delivery time for these items uh, could be up to two to three weeks. Um, so, because remember, you're sending your request, the other institution receives the request, they go, they pull the item off the shelf, they then have to pack it up and send it out in the mail. And that's a best case scenario where something happens the same day you submit it. So think about it, um, it could be a couple days as it goes to more than one institution. So if the first institution doesn't have the item on the shelf, again, it could be checked out, it could be, their copy could be missing. Um, it then goes to another uh, institution. Um, so just be aware that the delivery time for these items, again, could be, it's going to be probably at minimum two weeks just with the um, delays in, uh, with the post office and then also with just the, the time it takes to actually pull the items, process them, package them up, all that. If you just need a digital item, so if you just need one chapter of a book, if you just need one article from a journal, the turnaround time on that is much faster um, because you don't have to worry about um, you know, that extra time that's taken um, through with transit. You'll receive, you can receive those, uh, the digital items um, very quickly. So the first thing I wanna go over is we're gonna go over submitting a CLS request. And so I wanted to make sure I have this shown because um, when you go to, so if we go to, I'm already signed in, but if we're at the library webpage, um, one of the books that I read over quarantine was a collection of short stories by Octavia Butler called, uh, I think it's Blood Child and Other Stories. Um, so I'm gonna use that as my example. I really liked it and um, there's a couple stories that I, I kind of want to reread. So I'm going to take a look and see what we have. So if I'm on the UDC webpage, which is uh, udclibguides.com, um, there's a link to this page on udc.edu. There's also, um, if you just Google UDC library, this comes up. Um, so we're easy to find. So if I go to this UD cert, UDC search, uh, and I'm looking for this book, um, let's take a look. So up at the top, you see that I'm signed in. Um, it has my name. So going back to this screen, if, if I wasn't signed in, um, you will see, you would see like somebody said, it'll say login right here. If you go, um, and when you log in, first thing that pops up is gonna be this black box. You have two options, internal users or external users. 
It may sound counterintuitive, but what you're going to want to use is external users. If you see that UDC students, faculty, staff. Um, what that means is that it just means that your account, your library account information is coming externally um, from external to the library because it's actually coming from um, the records and the registrar's office. Um, so it may sound counterintuitive, but use external users. And give me a reminder, just remember it. You're a UDC student, so click external user. Next, you'll get the uh, UDC sign on. You may see, you'll probably have seen a screen similar to this uh, when you're signing on to My UDC, uh, for example. Um, the only thing different about this is that normally you would sign in with your just your username, just, um, just the, that part. Uh, if you're signing in here, if you're signing into Primo, which is the our catalog, it's going to um, make sure you're using the at udc.edu part as well. Um, not everything uses that. It is it is underneath here, but just so you're just so you um, when you go to sign in, make sure that you're using that at udc.edu as well. All right, so we're back in our results. And I'm interested in seeing what we have uh, at the UDC library. So you can change what we have here. Um, everything, everything searches not just what we have at UDC, but also all of our um, partner universities in WRLC. So this searches our catalog. It searches, um, you know, Georgetown, Howard, all those other schools. If you just want to see what we have at the UDC library, you can change it to UDC library catalog. So that's what I did here. And I can see that our copy of uh, Blood Child and Other Stories by Octavia Butler is not available because our copy is missing. So um, that is a bummer. So I'm going to see what we have um, across the consortium. So um, you can always um, refine your results by using these filters on the side. Um, so you notice there's a lot of sort of books, um, either, a, either other books by Octavia Butler or articles about Octavia's, uh, Octavia Butler's work. But if we go down, uh, we can see that um, so here's Blood Child and Other Stories, again, not available, missing. But if I click on this, we can see our copy uh, at the main library is not available, but it is available at some of our consortium libraries. So we see that there's four other institutions that carry this book that are available. So if I just click, if I just wanted some more information about where um, this book could possibly be located. So I see that like at the Gallaudet University Library, it is available. Um, their copy is at the WRLC Shared Collections Facility. Um, but it's like a big, like a big uh, warehouse or it's a you know big storage facility that is shared by all of our consortium libraries. Um, so I can go back, I can see that. So it's available at a number of different institutions. So if I want to request this book, I can go up here to where it says CLS request. Um, promises a two or three day delivery. And so on this, it'll take the information um, about this book and it'll put it on into this form. So on this form, even though there is the options for articles or book chapters and articles, do not click those. Don't use those because um, all of the institutions are not set up for this. So what it's going to do is you're immediately going to get an, uh, a message from the system saying that there is nobody available to lend you this item. Um, so remember, CLS is only for physical items. So I want this physical, uh, a physical copy of this book. So it's already filled out the title here. Uh, my email is already filled out. Um, if you want to, you can add a not needed after. So if you need something pretty urgently, and if you're not able to get it right away, you don't 
care about it after that point, you can add in that, that not needed after. Don't click the willing to pay. Um, that's not something you need to worry about. So we can just hit send request and you'll get an email confirmation and you'll get an email uh, when the book is ready for you to pick up at the UDC library. So the pickup shelf um, for, at, for the UDC library is uh, at our main library on the Van Ness campus in building 39. So that's where you would go to come in to pick it up. Uh, you will need your uh, student ID, your one card in order to check out the item. And you'll, in order to come onto campus, you'll need to be wearing a mask or some or a face covering. Right. I'm just going to pause see if there's any questions about CLS. Um, just going to the chat. Uh, seeing any. So one other thing I do want to show while we're here is you can request items that UDC owns. So if I take out Blood Child, for example, um, in the same way. So if you want to, if you're at home and you want to request a book, so let's say you're interested in some other uh, books about Octavia Butler. So this one is available at the UDC Library Main Stacks. So we can go in here and it's the same thing. So we go to request UDC copy um, to tell you that pickup location is the main library, uh, terms of use, um, just click on the term and then just click on send request and the same thing, same thing happens. It just means that it comes to the UDC library first. So we can pull our copy for you and it'll be waiting for you on the shelf and you'll get an email notification when it's ready for you to pick up. All right, so that is CLS. I'm just going to go in here. Um, I have these uh, screenshots prepared just in case anything um, went wrong. All right, so for ILL, what we have, um, ILL, is a separate system than the UDC catalog. To access ILL, um, it's under your My Library account. So if we go to My Library account, okay, we're back on the main library webpage, the udc.libguidance.com. Down here in the bottom left-hand corner, we've got some quick links to some other places, but the My Library account is what I'm looking for right now. Again, it'll give you a login screen. If you're already logged in from when you signed in a Primo, you, don't, you won't need to log in again. This shows you everything that you have checked out currently. So this shows that, um, for example, I have a book uh, checked out right now uh, from UDC. It lets you know if you have any fines or fees, any requests that you've submitted that you're waiting um, for a response from any blocks or messages, but right here is what I'm looking for right now, which is ILO requests. So let's sign in here. And this is the main uh, Iliad screen when you sign in. So these are some outstanding requests that I put in. Um, there are two fairly rare titles that um, I wasn't super confident that I could get, but I figured, you know, might as well give it a try. So to, so, so to submit requests, um, you can select one of these three options. So right now I'm still looking for uh, Blood Child by Octavia Butler. So I'm gonna submit a book request. So this is for a physical item. You want a physical book to be sent to the UDC library. So we have this form that we need to fill out. Um, so the, the red asterisk indicates that this is a required field. So you'll need to fill out at least the ones with the red stars. So author and editors, title, you're not wanted after date. By default, it'll give you a year. Um, so um, one tip is in the, if you go back to not this one, let's see here. If we go back to the catalog, we go down to right here, so click on the item again. Down below the availability um, is some details, and I can use these details, let me just pop this out, uh, to 
add to this form. So I know that the author is Octavia Butler. I know that the title is Blood Child and other stories. You can copy and paste directly from the catalog if you want to. Um, publisher, so yeah, I can grab a publisher from here. Uh, so your York's actually the place of publication, so let's put that in there, and so on and so forth. Uh, the MOCAD, kind of the most important thing to put in, extra piece of information that you don't have to put in, but is very helpful if you do, is the ISBN number or the ISBN, um, which you, it'll note if given will speed up request processing. So you can put that in, um, we'll leave the rest of this blank. Some other things to look out for is, will you accept the item in a language other than English? So it'll either ask you yes or no. Uh, this is important, especially if an item was originally published in another language. Um, so for example, if you are fluent in both Spanish and English, and you're looking for a work that was originally published in Spanish, if you put no, it'll only look for English language items. So whereas if you want the original Spanish, make sure that you put yes, so that when you put in the information, it'll flag that it is okay to send you a language that, um, send you an item that isn't a language other than English. So I'm gonna keep that as no for right now. And then uh, will you accept an alternate edition of this item? For certain things, um, you know, popular novels, uh, um, other items, you may not care so much about the edition of the item. For other things, it is very important that you get a specific edition of the item. In that case, make sure you have the, especially the public, at least the publication dates or the edition, um, preferably both for the item, and then say you will not accept. Uh, will you accept an alternate edition of this item? Um, for novels, it doesn't necessarily matter. For certain things, it might matter. So if you only want that one specific thing, make sure you leave it as no. Other notes you may want to put in, um, again, put any information that could help someone find the item as well as any other pertinent information. And then submit request. Um, again, like with uh, CLS, you will receive an email when the item is ready for you to come pick up at the library. So if you haven't received an email yet, um, that means that it has not been received by the library yet. Um, so keep that in mind. And once you submitted an item, make sure that you're checking your uh, UDC email regularly. So um, the other options that you have is if you want a copy of an article. So for the article, um, at the very minimum, we need the title of the journal, if it's conference proceedings and anthology. Again, please do not abbreviate. It says, please don't abbreviate unless your citation is abbreviated. Even then, I would say don't. Um, there's a lot of, uh, especially um, discipline-specific journals that use a lot of the same words and use abbreviations for those. So like, for example, like, you know, American Journal of Chemists might be regularly abbreviated to AM, J, Chem, um, which in your discipline, you may recognize the name of that journal right away, but for somebody who doesn't regularly work in that uh, discipline, it may be hard to parse what the abbreviations stand for. So please type out the full title of the journal. And this is, by the way, also the title. Uh, please don't just write journal in here or title. Um, you should, if you look, especially if you're requesting an article based on a citation, you should have this information, the title. Um, the article title is uh, also needed. We can look up the rest of this information, but um, even though it is not required, having things like the volume, the issue number or designation, the month, year, inclusive pages, um, ISSN, all of those are very helpful in making sure that the request 
goes through as soon as possible and that you have as short as possible uh, turnaround time to you receiving the item that you're looking for. Uh, again, we accept the language item in a language other than English. Um, important to keep an eye out, especially if it's a journal that was originally published in another language uh, and submit request. And then finally, we also have the book chapter copy. Um, and again, looking for this similar um, information, just remember when you're filling these out that the more information you put in here, the easier it is for both um, the ILL staff at UDC and at other universities to know precisely what it is that you're looking for without having to look things up or guess or, you know, worst case is we'll send the request back to you for you to act to ask for more information or for you to clarify what it is you're looking for. Um, so article copies and book chapter copies, um, those, like I said, those are digital or electronic copies of those. They arrive as PDFs. And when those are available for you to download, you'll receive an email, which will provide you a link back to Iliad. Um, and you can always go in and get those under here where it says uh, view electronically received articles. So I don't have any myself right now. Um, so you can go in, you can grab them, you can download them from here. Be aware that uh, the articles are only available for you for 30 days from the date of posting. So as soon as you receive the email that is available for you to get, make sure that you're logging in right away and act downloading the copy from here because it will disappear from there. We've had people, um, you know, not do that and have to resubmit the requests because they lost access to the article. So, um, yeah, so that is, um, additionally, you can also see what items you have checked out. In this checked out items, I don't have, currently have any, so you can't see it, but there will be a button you can request a, um, it'll tell you if renewals are available. So, um, I will say sometimes um, how long you have an ILL item is up to the lending institution. Sometimes they don't give you a lot of time with an item. Um, so, and especially once you're factoring in the transit time to get here through the mail, um, sometimes by the time we've received the item, you may only have a few days with it before it's due back. In those cases, um, go into your checkout items and see if you have, if renewals are available. If they are, uh, you can submit a renewal and um, then it'll be up, to, again, it's up to the other institution to accept that. I know that we always um, sign off on renewals for ILL um, and most institutions will as well. All right, uh, so that is ILL. And then I just wanted to really uh, briefly uh, check in with, um, uh, with a DCPL. Um, so DCPL, similar thing, once you get signed in up at the top with your account, do a search. In this case, I've got Bloodshot and Other Stories, Octavia Butler, it's a book. Um, they have a lot of copies of this. There's no holds, and most of them are not checked out. And there's a couple that are checked out. But what you can do is you can place a hold, and I'm already, okay, so I'm already signed out of that. But basically, it'll ask you where you want to pick up. Um, there are a lot, they have a lot of locations. So you can find the one that's closest to you when you're setting up your account uh, and go from there. So just to quickly go back to here. If you don't have a DCPL account yet, um, there is information on their main page, which is dclibrary.org. You can get a library card, and then they walk you through the steps here. Um, who can get a card? So anyone who you know lives, works, pays taxes, or attends school in uh, UDC. So even if you don't uh, live in the District of Columbia, but you do attend UDC, you can get a card. Um, additionally, if, you if you're a resident in not just uh, the District of Columbia, 
but also some of the neighboring counties or cities in Maryland or Virginia, you can also get uh, a DC public library card. Um, and there are so, so on this uh, get a card page, there's all the steps you need to walk through. You can um, submit your application online or you can uh, go in in person. Okay, and that is it for me. So I'm just gonna stop sharing right now and just see if we have any questions. All right, not seeing any, so I am gonna turn it over to Chris. Uh, all right, Chris, it is uh, all you. Thank you very much, Glenn. And uh, I'll uh, be sharing my screen as well. Here we go. I'm uh, Chris Anglin. I'm uh, the university archivist and one of the reference librarians here at UDC. And I'll be for uh, talking about uh, outside the library theme today, we'll be talking about uh, uh, DC libraries and archives, the libraries and archives in this area that are not a part of UDC as part of this webinar series. In Washington, DC is a, uh, has the greatest concentration of libraries and archives anywhere in the uh, United States. The uh, libraries in the district represent an incredible amount of variety of, in scope, content, and uh, subject matter. They're more and more than just merely repositories. Many of the uh, district libraries and archives stand as works of architectural splendor, monuments to history, and witnesses to uh, history of themselves and of the people who uh, uh, lived and worked here in the District of Columbia. Before I get into some of the specific uh, examples of libraries and archives, I thought it would be a good idea to remind ourselves what a uh, library or archives is what they are. And for archives, they these are because there are some distinct differences between uh, archives and special collections. Uh, you hear both of these terms are both uh, terms of art in the librarianship community. So we should know the difference between the two of them. It, uh, also, uh, these are very, uh, these, there's some very different uh, uh, characteristics of these that you should know and there's very different characteristics uh, between uh, archives and libraries chief of which between uh, archives and libraries itself is that in archives you uh, predominantly find uh, primary sources whereas in books whereas in libraries you would find predominantly secondary sources so uh, we're talking about primary sources in archives this is the information itself secondary sources are often uh, uh, interpret the primary sources. So for archives, you have uh, an organized collection of non-current records. These can either be activities of government organizations, institution, or other corporate bodies, or they're the personal papers of one or more individuals. They can also be papers of families, say the family Grimke, a famous family uh, that uh, resided here in DC at the turn of the last century, or groups uh, or organizations, such as uh, some of the organizations that we have at UDC. Uh, they uh, are they have their archives here and they are organized by uh, uh, by the group that created them they are retained permanently or for a designated or indeterminate period by their original by their originator the person who created the records or the successor, successor those who've been designated to uh, uh, basically have rights to the to the documents. They're uh, put in the archives for their permanent historical information, evidential, legal, administrative, or financial value. Phenomenally, what we'll be talking uh, about today is uh, their permanent historical value or informational value. Uh, the others are important, but we'll be talking predominantly today about their permanent historical value. And usually uh, uh, they're kept in archives in a repository managed and maintained by a trained archivist, someone who has gone to school classes in archives. 
So what are special collections? Special collections are found in many public and academic libraries. They often have a special uh, areas within the, uh, uh, their collections that house the special collection. And these are uh, often uh, areas are, that have resources in a variety of different formats that are distinctive and have intrinsic value to the institution itself. These uh, areas include rare books, genealogies, archives, uh, as archives in this case be a, a subsection of the special collections, local history, theses or dissertations, from, and books from local authors. The selection of materials for these uh, special uh, areas reflect the institution's mission, policy, history, as well as user needs. The selection criteria are intended to uh, build on the preservation and enhancement of these important collections. Special collections normally uh, state their, but are pretty explicit about stating their scope and purpose of the collection, and items in the special collections normally have uh, unique attributes that require uh, libraries to limit their access and control uh, the physical environment, uh, such as heat and humidity, and restrict circulation. The security that is a concern for special uh, uh, collections librarian are based on the value, rarity, or fragility of the item itself. Now we'll uh, move to uh, talking about some of the leading uh, libraries and archives in the DC areas, and we'll be talking about three different types of libraries and archives. First are the federal libraries and archives, and three examples we'll be talking about are the uh, Library of Congress, the Smithsonian Library, and the National Archives. Then we'll be talking about uh, those that are uh, DC oriented, are the DC libraries and archives, and these are specifically the DC, it's the DC public libraries, people, people's archives, the DC History Center, uh, which is owned by the DC, which is a separate entity from DCPL, and then a third separate M, M, uh, entity which is owned by. Uh, uh, DC Public Schools is the Sumner School Archives. So the uh, archives of uh, DCPS are kept in Sumner School, which is, uh, we'll be talking about in a moment. And then we'll be talking about a third type of uh, uh, library and archives in these special collection library and archives. And these are Howard University's Moreland Springer collection and GW. Collections. And this is the old Carnegie Library that now owns uh, the DC History Center. It's formerly used to uh, belong to UDC and was formerly the uh, uh, Central Library for Washington, DC before uh, MLK uh, was uh, uh, designated downtown. So uh, it's a Central Library for DC. So federal libraries and archives, our first one, and we'll begin with the Library of Congress. This is one of the most famous and largest libraries in the world. It is both a research and an architectural treasure. Uh, one thing that I should mention, uh, in addition to actually going to any of these libraries that I mentioned, that in addition to the uh, research uh, resources that they have on site, they also have but online uh, digital research, research sources that don't necessarily have the entire collection online, but provide access to many of their highlights online. So you, you don't uh, necessarily have to go to any of them. You can just uh, uh, consult their online uh, catalogs or uh, their online digital collections. And you can find a whole uh, uh, worth a, a whole lot of uh, materials that way, some that uh, would be of use to you for your various papers. So in the case of a uh, uh, Library of Congress, you have uh, chronicling uh, uh, America's newspapers. You also have African-American perspectives reflected in a wide variety of uh, LCs, digital online collections. And you have a good number of American, uh, African-American musical recordings as well. So, so uh, that is a Library of Congress, one of the uh, uh, federal libraries another uh, system actually federal libraries one system but 20 libraries are this is the smithsonian libraries and archives uh, one of them is the uh, national museum of american history which includes a broad aspect of social and cultural history primarily of the united states and uh, international history of science and technology then you have a number of uh, uh, of histories that have uh, of uh, libraries that have their own specialization, like the African-American history, one of the uh, 
museum that recently opened and then you have and that has a pretty sizable and growing library and then you have this uh, Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum Library, the Dibner Library of Science and Technology, the Prayer uh, Gallery and Sackler uh, Gallery Library, uh, the Coleman Library of Natural History and the National Air and Space uh, uh, Museum Library, all of all of which are specialized libraries that are part of the Smithsonian Library and Archives system. And uh, when we're talking about archives, you can't uh, talk about American archives without talking about uh, the lib uh, National Archives. There are two uh, uh, National Archives facility, two major National Archives facility in Washington DC area called, uh, the first one is called NARA One. This is a uh, NARA One, which is a, a National Archives uh, that was a building that was established in 1935. And then you have NARA 2, which is in, in Aldelphi, uh, Maryland, U, near uh, University of Maryland. That's a, uh, that's a 1970s building called uh, NARA 2. In both, in both cases, the National Archives preserves and provides access to a variety of uh, government and historical records. Some of the major collections that you'll find in the National Archives are census records, military service and pension records, passenger arrival records, naturalization records, uh, Freedmen uh, Bureau's records, and uh, slavery records. You'll also find that you'll also be getting access to the uh, uh, 1950 archives will become publicly available uh, as as a, uh, 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 as a embargo period for those had that uh, is about to pass with the uh, because it's been 70 years and after 70 years the national uh, uh, census this decennial census becomes freely available to uh, the uh, uh, to the public so then the next uh, uh, type of libraries that we'll be talking about are those that are uh, local libraries that belong to the uh, that are DC oriented, DC history oriented, and these are the DC libraries and archives. And uh, the first one we'll be talking about is the District of Columbia Public Library People's Archives. The People's Archives, and this was uh, the Washingtonian room, uh, room when it uh, was temporarily here at uh, just across the street, just across uh, the street from UDC. The People's Archives has unique resources on DC's history and culture. This repository preserves and makes accessible the culture and history of DC's diverse people. Now, uh, remember, we're still talking about uh, uh, archival materials for the most part. And uh, for archival materials, these institutions, what they're doing is preserving and making accessible uh, primary sources, uh, some that are quite old and quite rare. So as opposed to the secondary sources that you would uh, find in the main stacks of, of uh, your public libraries, including MLK Library downtown. Uh, this archive, the people are, People's Archives, in, uh, consists of the Washingtonian collection, special materials, including reference books documenting uh, the history of DC's local life uh, since even before uh, DC became an entity, be, became its own entity in 1791. Then you have uh, the Black Studies collection at the MLK Library. This uh, is downtown, and the book collection documents, for example, uh, African American experience through the Af Af African diaspora, and emphasizes civil rights uh, and uh, social justice. The uh, Peabody Room is located at uh, Georgetown Branch Library. This specializes in Georgetown history. We now think of uh, Georgetown as being a, a, a major neighborhood in DC, but uh, when uh, the district was established, uh, Georgetown was its own independent city. So some of the special gems from the uh, District of Columbia Public Library collection that you uh, uh, should be aware of are the uh, digital, digital collections that you can freely uh, get access to anywhere as long as you have uh, your uh, DCPL card and D and Dig DC houses all DCPL digitized materials, including maps, photos, postcards, pamphlets, historical newspapers, including both the Washington Post and Washington Star, and web archives. The uh, DC Community Archives and 
uh, both in in both cases for the uh, Washington Post and for the uh, Washington Star. It has uh, uh, the papers from uh, both the Post and the Star from the time that these uh, newspapers were originally published. And then you have uh, the uh, uh, DC Community Archives, DCPL Archives, includes the personal papers, business and organizational records, photographs, and ephemeral uh, items that document local DC history and culture. You have, uh, and what is especially nice is a uh, uh, DCPL also has the Washington Star photo collection. So, uh, uh, Newspapers call their uh, historical photo collection morgues. So uh, the DCPL has a morgue for the Washington Star. Then it has a really a very well developed uh, collection of Black uh, artists and also uh, a jazz archives oral history. When we talk about oral history, we're basically talking about uh, where uh, a library or archives uh, uh, has uh, interviews some of the people who have uh, lived who are lived through uh, interesting times, uh, noteworthy times. Many of them are not, noteworthy people who uh, had much to do with some of the trends of the time. And, the, and their recollections are preserved for posterity in oral as oral history. And uh, these uh, uh, archivists, one of the concerns of archivists is to make sure that uh, these records uh, do indeed uh, uh, are available for posterity. So much of their concerns is about uh, archival quality materials, making sure that uh, the material is uh, placed in archival uh, quality recordings in order to uh, maintain uh, uh, these records for all posterity. Now, uh, uh, the last uh, DC uh, uh, oriented uh, repository we'll talk about is the DC History Center or and the DC Kiplinger Research Library. Uh, this is not affiliated with the DC uh, Public Library. It's its own uh, uh, community nonprofit, but specializes in DC history and seeks to uh, reach every part of the city to preserve and interpret stories of DC diverse people, neighborhoods, and institutions. Uh, it has extensive uh, collections on DC history. Some of the strengths of the collection include its uh, DC's uh, architecture and uh, physical development, uh, art, culture, and recreation, uh, community and neighborhood uh, families and notable individuals. Uh, local business, industry, and economic development, and also religious sites and local uh, houses of worship. So uh, this again is a uh, uh, DC History Center. This is the uh, at the former uh, Central Library at uh, of DC. It was uh, the Washington DC's at Carnegie Library when uh, so it was funded by uh, the generous donations of uh, uh, Andrew Carnegie. And uh, it uh, also at one time was one of uh, uh, the uh, libraries that belonged to at UDC when UDC was thinking of making its main campus downtown, downtown Washington. And then uh, the last one we'll uh, talk about in terms of local uh, libraries would be the uh, Sumner School Archives and Museums. This is uh, owned by DCPS and uh, it's a historic site that was one of the first public schools in the United States for um, African-American children. As a repository for DC Public Schools Archives, Sumner School um, houses the official DC Public Schools records and artifacts relating to uh, DC Public Schools history. Sumner is also a cultural venue hosting programs, events, and uh, exhibitions. Because uh, some of our former uh, uh, predecessor schools were part of uh, DC Public Schools for a while, you'll also see uh, some materials that uh, relate to uh, these former uh, uh, schools, such as uh, minor, minor normal schools, uh, Wilson's Teachers College, and uh, uh, those, those institutions, DC Teachers College, all of those would be, uh, their records would be kept here as well. And all of these became part of what we now know as uh, uh, University of the District of Columbia. Sumner is also a cultural venue hosting programs, events, and exhibitions. Now the uh, last type of archives that we'll be talking about are the academic archives. And uh, these are two examples we'll be talking about are uh, of Springer Moreland over at uh, Howard University and uh, the GW archives of uh, uh, special collections over at uh, George Washington University. 
Now, uh, Springer, Mar uh, Moreland Springer Research Center is located at the campus of Howard University at its historic Founders Library. Uh, MSRC collects, preserves, organizes, and makes available and accessible research on a wide, ra wide range of resources on the Black experience in the African diaspora. When we speak of the African diaspora, we're uh, talking about uh, not only about uh, uh, the uh, travels of, of uh, journeys of African Americans from Africa to the United States. We're talking about uh, the journeys of African Ameri of Africans from uh, Africa to uh, uh, places all over the world, Central, Central America, the Caribbean countries, uh, South America, for example. MSRC is a repository for documenting the history and culture of people of descent, uh, people who descended from uh, from Africa and uh, worldwide. And uh, lastly, we'll be talking about uh, GW's uh, Special Collections Research, SCRC. SCRC documents uh, yeah, DC's political, economic, social, and cultural history from DC's creation in 1791 to the present. The collection focuses on a wide range of topics, including the built environment or architecture, DC politics and government, the literary community and changing literary community in DC over the years, over the decades, uh, various local businesses, DC's collections of uh, DC neighborhoods and civic associations. The collection also uh, has important holdings on uh, civil rights in DC, the LGBTQ plus community and uh, DC during the 1960s when there was monumental change in the city at that time. Along with the primary source, source materials, such as letters, various letters, diaries, videos, and audio recordings, journals, maps, and ledgers, newsletters, and meeting minutes of the uh, collection at SCRC uh, includes more than uh, 20,000 monographs on uh, DC history. So uh, if, you need, uh, if you need more information, if you uh, need to have access or contact to uh, the people of uh, any of these uh, institutions who can help you with your various research needs, be sure to reach out and contact me. I'm Chris Anglum, University, of Ar uh, University Archivist and Reference Librarian. Uh, this is my uh, email address and also my uh, phone number. And uh, uh, I also know uh, Many of these, the people here uh, who have, uh, uh, who are my colleagues in this, uh, in these areas, I, I've worked with, for uh, with them for the past uh, for a rather long period of time, know them well, and and can certainly uh, help you get uh, uh, the information you need through a uh, personal contact. So uh, with that, I conclude my presentation and give the uh, uh, control of the session to uh, Megan. Thank you, Chris and Glenn. That was wonderful. I actually know I learned a few things about some of the local archives. I want to thank everyone for attending today. And if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat right now while we are being recorded. And in a few minutes, I will give time for some unrecorded questions if you'd prefer that. I am also dropping a feedback survey in the chat, and we'd love your feedback on this so we know what sort of events to present in the future. So I'll give a minute. Um, I just really wanted just to briefly, I forgot to mention when I was talking about the DC Public Library webpage, they don't, if you're look, it's not just books, um, they also have um, streaming services, uh, video, audio, they have uh, databases and journals just like we do, so there may be some stuff that they have that we don't. Um, I just wanted, to, I think I maybe have like sold them a little short on like what the services that they offer. Um, they have computer labs, so but definitely check out um, the, the DCPL. I think they've, they have a lot of really great resources that um, you can easily avail yourself of. And in many cases, it's probably easier to get to them than it would be to us, just because they have so many locations. If you are interested in... Oh, I was going to say, if you are interested in learning more about DCPL, we actually did a webinar with them a few months ago where they spoke specifically to what was available to UDC students using their UDC One card uh, to get access. Um, and that is recorded and available through our YouTube. The only thing I wanted to add in addition to what uh, uh, Megan and uh, uh, 
Glenn said is that for historical newspapers, uh, both, again, both the Washington Post and uh, uh, Star, Washington Star are available through uh, uh, DCPL, through their uh, website. They're uh, really a fantastic website, so you can get a lot of historical information from their website. And uh, Chronicling American uh, Newspapers also has a number of other uh, uh, Washington historical Washington uh, newspapers too. So uh, uh, yeah, definitely look at uh, look at that. Uh, even uh, they have like the Washington Bee, which is an African American newspaper, uh, historic African American newspaper. You can get that through Chronicling American Resources, uh, Chronicling American Newspapers. Great stuff. We are big fans of DCPL and they are big fans of us. You know, libraries love libraries. <laughs> I haven't seen any questions come in, so I do want to thank you for attending. And this recording will be available soon on our YouTube.